Uh, Water Talks has four main components. It was started in 2019. The first component was authentic and often action-based community engagement. The second component was a thorough strengths and needs assessment that was completed in 2021. And you can find the results of that needs assessment at the Redesign LA website and also at the Water Talks website. Um, and then the third component was uh, developing projects to meet the needs that were identified in the needs assessment. And the fourth is having workshops and tours and things like this to share what we have been learning about community-driven design and water projects. So thank you all for joining us today. And I will hand it back to Ariel. Thank you, Amanda. Um, all right, so, and then I wanna do some thank yous. First of all, thank you to the city of Pomona. We really love being here. It's such a, hopefully the sun will come out. We're all, we all want some sunshine, right? Uh, it's been a little gray these past few weeks, um, but thank you to the city of Pomona. And uh, thank you to Julie Carver, the environmental compliance officer, Alfredo, who's gonna join us later, Camacho, the planning commissioner, and the Parks and Rec staff here as well. Really appreciate um, you welcome, welcoming us here. Uh, and then also I'd like to thank uh, my fellow organizers of this event. Uh, day one with James and Mario, thank you guys so much. We also want to thank uh, Council for Watershed Health, Drew, who really took the bulk of the planning the event, and Nate. Um, and then we have Active SGV as well, who's ready to get on those bikes later. That's going to be super fun. Um, and then also Tree People and Stand Tech. A huge part of this Water Talks program has been uh, really ensuring that we are building authentic relationships with tribes. And we actually have quite a few of the projects that Amanda mentioned are tribal focused. And we're working with uh, two tribal conservancies and directly with uh, tribal nations and members. So we start all of our events with a land acknowledgement. Um, and this land acknowledgement that I'm about to read is actually from um, a participant in Water Talks, Jessica Calderon, who works for Sacred Places Indigenous um, Organization. So, we honor and acknowledge our Tongva relatives of the past and the present throughout Los Angeles County, parts of Orange County, parts of San Bernardino County, as well as the four Southern Channel Islands, Catalina, Santa Barbara, San Nicolas, and San Clemente. We acknowledge our responsibility to protect these unceded territories and all that is sacred that includes the land, water, plant, animal, and human relatives. We uphold this responsibility as stewards who hold space on these lands. Um, if you look up here, there's a little QR code uh, where if you don't know the native lands that you reside, um, this QR code takes you to a map that helps you identify that. Um, so, Thank you all for sharing this land acknowledgement with me. Uh, we also have other resources on those water talk sites that Amanda mentioned that can lead you to allyship trainings and things like that that happened as a part of water talks. All right, next up, I'm really excited to welcome Alfredo Camacho, who is going to say a few words, and I believe was the brain the brainchild for this event. So <laughs> we're grateful to have him today. I have my notes here. I don't, I don't want to miss anything. Um, so hi everyone. Um, as Ariel mentioned, my name is Alfredo. I serve on the Planning Commission here in the city of Pomona. Um, prior to, um, so I, I don't work um, at day one anymore, and so that's sort of where uh, Ariel mentioned that, that you know that was the brainchild of this event. Um, so I used to work at day one, and that's sort of where I first heard about Green Streets. Um, and I got to work with Green Streets. So I just want to walk you through a little bit about like what that looked like. Um, so I first got connected to Water Talks again through working at day one. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I did there was uh, actually had James's old job. I was a watershed coordinator. Um, and it was really cool because I got to talk to people about um, all these really cool projects. And I got to work with the cities. Um, I got to work with residents. And um, what I heard constantly was, you know, they want to see projects, but um, the number one complaint we got a lot was streets. And so as someone who really loves parks and building more parks, um, I had to check my bias um, when people would say like, why are you gonna fix, why are you gonna build more parks when the streets look like that? And so for me, I had to, I pivoted and I said, all right, so I wanna make sure um, I'm hearing, um, you know, I'm meeting them where they're at. So we got visual, so that visual looks really beautiful. We, um, that's sort of what I brought in. I was like, all right, let me, 
show them visually like what this can look like. And so when we did that, it was a game changer. Um, people were on board. They wanted to see green streets. Um, number one complaint we got was aesthetics, like the city, you know, wherever we were. Um, they didn't like the way the city looked. They, they wanted to improve it. Um, we got safety a lot. They felt like cars in the road and, you know, their children, um, they were in stark, you know, contrast of each other. Um, shit, the heat conditions, we got that a lot as well. Um, like, why am I, I going to walk if the, you know, it's hot? <laughs> um, I'm not going to walk. So we got a lot of that. And so Green Street sort of was a, a, an answer to all of that. So it merges aesthetics, it merges safety um, with, with you know, some add-ons. It also captures stormwater, um, it mitigates heat. So that was the answer. Um, and prior to leaving, um, sort of we started talking about green streets here in the region. Um, of course, I left, but you know, I left the, the project in good hands, and I'm really excited that this came out of it. Um, I first heard about green streets through a learning exchange, if you will, from other cities. Um, that was the beauty of working at day one and working across the region was that I got to hear from what other cities were doing. So I'm really excited. I hope you all, um, if you've never heard of Art Green Streets before, if you have, um, I hope you get some new information today. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. I'll be here if you all um, you know, want to talk with me. Um, but I'll pass it back to Ariel to continue the event. Thank you so much, Abdo. Great. All right, so let's get started. We have our first um, keynote speaker here this morning, Daniel Apt, who's going to be talking more about Green Street. So I'm going to pass it over to him. I'm Daniel Apt with the LAMU. Um, I actually grew up in the San Gabriel Valley in San Marino, so very familiar with the area and uh, passionate about trying to, to do something to improve uh, San Gabriel Valley. So I'm going to talk a little bit, provide some examples of, of Green Streets. I've been involved a lot with Green Street design, public outreach, um, evaluating the benefits of Green Streets from a, a, a pollutant removal perspective. Um, so a lot, lot of time focused on this particular subject. And you, you'll see as I go through, I'm, I'm fairly passionate about it. So um, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. I do want to put a special thanks out. Some of the photos and graphics uh, that you'll see today were provided by Darla Ellswick. She used to be the, um, the coordinator of the LID Center in the Central Coast. Uh, Wayne Carlson of AHBL, who actually grew up in Glendora here. And the late uh, Kevin Robert Perry of Urban Rain Design. So what are some of the drivers that we see for Green Streets? We're all familiar with the MS4 permit. Um, and the watershed management plans uh, that were developed for, uh, for this area specifically, being driven by the total maximum daily loads. Uh, but we also see some other things. Um, meeting post-construction requirements specifically on street redevelopment, but then also thinking about potentially using green streets as offsets, right? Offsets as part of stormwater credits to be able to build more in the public right-of-way and take burden off a whole host of distributed uh, BMPs on uh, new and redevelopment. So Green Streets can really offer that as, a, as an opportunity as well. We also see that uh, Green Streets, there's been a, lot, a fair amount of studies that have shown that uh, green infrastructure, Green Streets, can help with flood control, reducing the amount of water that is getting to our flood control system, as well as kind of the capital cost needed to uh, to uh, upgrade and maintain the flood control system. We also see this movement for complete streets. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but integrating some of the things that were already talked about today, about uh, pedestrian mobility, about aesthetics, about reducing heat, heat island effect, we really have this concept of, of complete streets. And that's actually kind of come a little bit before the concept of green streets. So what we're trying to do now is make sure that complete streets integrate a green stormwater component as well. Uh, traffic calming, heard a lot about uh, safety um, and the concerns of safety for, for children and pedestrians. So traffic calming is, can be a really big portion of, of uh, green streets and some of the drivers for integrating these type of systems. And then of course aesthetics. We heard uh, just a little while ago that some of the feedback from the planning commissioner was we don't like the look of our, our cities, right? And what's the main area where people see their cities, it's, it's on the streets, right? So streets can really provide an avenue for increasing its aesthetics 
uh, increasing property values, and um, providing a more sustainable and presentable uh, community. Okay, some of the factors that influence uh, street right-of-way design. So, um, looking at some of the conventional functions versus emerging functions. So, obviously, for, from a conventional standpoint, we need we have mobility needs, um, and you know, transit. Um, looking at cars, mass transit, walking, and biking. But now we're we're adding some of the social, economic, and environmental objectives. So we're we're looking to pull more out of our streets themselves, do more sustainably with our streets. So what does that mean? As we try to integrate stormwater management, um, uh, accommodating all the utilities, greening, and economic vitality, what that does is it creates competition for that street right of way. And so uh, space becomes at a premium, right, of what are the type of benefits. And there's lots of different options that we can integrate into these things, uh, into, into green streets. And it's really about prioritizing and understanding what the community really wants to see and what, what those priorities are. So now I'm going to go through a few examples of, of uh, different green streets and configurations. Um, Something to keep in mind, and obviously I, I'm a stormwater professional, I come at it from a stormwater perspective. Um, streets really represent really the largest single contributor to urban stormwater runoff in most communities. And, and why is that? It's because they're largely made up of large impervious surfaces, right? And so if we can tackle streets, we can tackle a lot of the problems that we see with uncontrolled uh, stormwater runoff. So a couple examples, uh, these are from California. Uh, the first one is the uh, Los Angeles Valley College Coldwater Canyon Extension. I was part of the design team for that uh, in Van Nuys. Um, totally revi revitalized uh, 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 that particular street. Uh, I don't have any before pictures, but made a really big impact both on the college community as well as uh, the neighborhood. We also see some examples that have been in place for a while. Uh, this is 12th Street and Paso Robles. They've integrated some educational components into this, into this green street and taken up some of the, uh, the right-of-way to, to integrate some of the green street features. We've also seen green streets implemented um, in the Pacific Northwest quite a bit. They have a lot of experience with implementing these, uh, these type of systems. First example is 12th Avenue in Portland. This provides an example of more of an, like an ultra-urban situation where a green street can be integrated. Obviously, roads are at a premium and, and road space are at a premium up there, so the green streets were actually integrated more into the pedestrian right of way, but still we want to make sure that we're providing adequate space for pedestrians as well. Similar um, is the broad, Broadway Street in Spokane. This is an example um, in the Pacific Northwest, but a little bit drier climate, more like what we have here. Same type of concept where um, not in the street right away itself, but does provide uh, treatment for street runoff. And then we have different configurations. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but this is uh, Bothwell Way in the Seattle area. It's a very narrow strip. So the nice thing about Green Streets and the configuration of the stormwater elements in it is they're they're, they're really flexible. You can, you can do a lot of different things and you're not like constrained by just having to do a street one particular way. Lots of different configurations in this. These provide some examples of that. So we have all different types of streets uh, in East San, uh, San Gabriel Valley, including uh, neighborhood scales. So these are not just, okay, we can only put these on major streets. We can put them on the smallest scale streets as well. Here's a couple of examples, Southgate Neighborhood Green Street. This, this system has been in for about 10 years now. I was part of the, um, I was the lead designer on this. Um, and this was challenging. This was very new to people uh, in this neighborhood. And at first, we, we got a lot of uh, opposition to it. And, but a, a couple of the things that we did with the community was we reached out, we made sure they were part of the design process. They chose the plants. We had some pervious paver crosswalks. We allowed them to choose the type of pavers. And the next thing we knew, um, once we actually implemented, and we did uh, some events on uh, like Memorial Day, barbecue, we chalked off where these systems would be located. And um, the next thing we knew after we implemented it, people were trying to mimic the type of vegetation in their own yards as well. So there can be quite a big effect on neighborhoods themselves 
with integrating these type of systems. We also see an example in uh, Spokane, Washington, Lincoln Street. So different types of configurations in a variety of different types of streets are possible with green streets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we integrate green infrastructure principles into street design. So uh, first I'm going to talk about street landscapes. We'll talk a little bit about curb extensions, um, reducing the impervious area of streets, talking about narrow and skinny streets. We'll talk a little bit about on-street parking, and then using pervious pavement uh, parking uh, for parking and sidewalks. A lot of the existing standards that we see for streets out there have five-foot sidewalks and planter strips on both sides of the street. And the reason for this is pedestrians feel safer when there is that buffer between the street and the pedestrian right-of-way. Uh, it also provides an aesthetic benefit. Um, it provides a better rhythm to the streets. And all of these things are some of the basic principles of street design that we need to think about as we're developing green streets. So, in that same vein, we have the concept of a curve extension, right? We can integrate stormwater management in that same kind of landscape strip um, and providing that buffer between pedestrians and uh, vehicles, um, but at the same time make it more functional, be able to capture stormwater, be able to either infiltrate that into the ground or if we don't have the right soils, at least provide some, uh, some treatment before it goes into the storm. So this is an example of a, a curb extension on a street. Uh, this configuration is more of a staggered layout where you have uh, these essentially curb extensions, or we also call them bulb outs at different portions of the street. This kind of breaks up the street a little bit, provides a little bit more context in the street, um, and at the same time helps to provide uh, stormwater management. As opposed to another type of curb extension configuration where they're really symmetrical layouts, right? Providing some symmetry within a street where the curb extensions are right across from each other. Uh, in this configuration, we have previous, a previous paving parking zone uh, where we're getting that infiltration into the ground, um, but keeping the previous pavement out of the right of way for, for maintenance issues, um, but still providing that connection and that separation from the pedestrian right, right of way um, and essentially where the street is, providing that safety measure, and really helping to uh, reduce the overall impervious surface within that particular street. This pro just provides an example of a type of uh, curb extension uh, system that's you know, integrated into that particular landscape strip. We still have a, a good amount of right of way within the street here. Some other examples of um, bioretention planners that we integrate into streets. So this is another type of curb extension, more of a planter box style. Um, and then we also have seen uh, and can integrate in the median itself. So actually integrating bioretention in the median. This um, presents some challenges for some streets because as you know, most streets are crowned. And so uh, this is, usually more integrated into kind of new streets where you can reverse crown a road and, and put the stormwater system in, this, in the median itself. Excuse me. Yes. It's naive, but what's a crowned road? So a crowned road is um, when you're driving down the street, you'll see a crown in the road, and that's for drainage purposes. And for the most part, most streets are crowned, and drainage goes to the outside of the streets. And, and, but in some cases, you see crowning like a double crowned road where you have drainage on both sides, and then in other cases you have um, a more of a depressed median where the, all the stormwater drainage flows into the, into the media, media, middle of the street. Good question, though. Okay. So when I, I'm, I'm starting to use some terms, bioretention is one of those terms. And what we're trying to do with bioretention is we're trying to capture that stormwater runoff and essentially try to mimic pre-development conditions and infiltrate that water into the ground. Now, we may not always have the ability to infiltrate water in the ground depending upon the types of soils that are out there, but the idea is that we're capturing that stormwater, we're either infiltrating it 
Um, but even if we don't have good infiltration capacity, we do get evapotranspiration. We can integrate street trees associated with bioretention. Usually I like to put them on the side, not in the middle of the bioretention systems. And so what we get from that is we get settling and filtration of pollutants. Um, and then we also get the chemical and biological breakdown of those pollutants in these systems, right? So that's really the benefit. All that surface runoff, which would normally just go into the storm drain system, we're now retaining some of those pollutants. And we do get a reduction of that storm water. Um, either through evapotranspiration or infiltration or both. Um, and with that reduction, we're reducing the pollutants, and it helps to, um, to manage that stormwater more at the source and reduce the impacts downstream on our receiving waters. So that's the main intent of, of integrating the bioretentions in our streets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Narrow and skinny streets. So the idea with this concept is more of a road diet, right? So what we're trying to do here is, instead of just having these large amounts of impervious surface, there are some situations where we can actually reduce the impervious surface of the roadways. So um, this is an example of C Street in Seattle. It's actually one of the first green streets in the nation. And the concept behind it was not just taking a street and providing treatment for it, but actually reducing the street by about 50% of the impervious surface. So what that really helps with is it, reduce, it provides traffic calming, so it reduces speeding, reduces vehicle crashes. It helps with construction costs, um, reduces the distances for pedestrians crossing the street. Um, already talked about reducing the impervious surfaces. Helps to reduce street maintenance costs and then also helps with the urban heat island effect by reducing those, those dark impervious surfaces that are out there. This doesn't work everywhere, but there are some places where it can work. There also may be instances, even on larger streets, where maybe we don't need a sidewalk on both sides of the street, so we can reduce that amount of impervious surface by just putting a sidewalk on one side of the street. So on-street parking, obviously we're very car-centric in Southern California. There's a lot of parking and parking is a premium. But we can also integrate some green street features as part of the parking where this is a good example of integrating pervious pavers within a parking strip. So I wouldn't integrate pervious, although it's been done in Europe, uh, pervious pavers into a roadway itself. But doing it in a parking area does make a whole lot of sense. Also, uh, reducing the amount of uh, impervious surfaces through our sidewalks by integrating porous pavement um, or permeable surfaces in uh, our sidewalks is also another option. So complete streets were around a long time before green streets, and they were trying to integrate these concepts of pedestrian mobility and biking and a lot of other benefits. Not that they weren't thinking about stormwater management, but they weren't really thinking about stormwater management. And so what we're trying to do and push forward now is that to be a true complete street, greening of that street needs to be integrated into that. A lot of the early complete streets had um, <coughs> kind of vegetation and street trees and so forth. We're just trying to modify that to integrate complete street features. So on the left, you'll see uh, a typical complete street. There's a lot of different features with, you know, pedestrian bike mobility, some greening. What we want to do is modify that to have green streets be part of that. Integrating bioretention and that stormwater management piece is really critical. <coughs> so here are some e examples of what can be done within a, a green street layout. This is an example of an existing street. Um, and the example on the right here is a rendering of what we call an urban tree sponge example. So this is more of a light touch where we're just doing some, essentially some tree wells at various locations along the street, not really affecting that much of where the parking is. We do have a, a bike lane integrated here, but we call this more of a light touch and you can see some pervious pavement in the front here um, because it's not as intensive. Um, and depending upon budgets and so forth, you still get a lot of stormwater benefit from this, um, but it's not as costly. And then we have another option where this is kind of more of a, of, uh, of 
more of an intense or a bold street reconfiguration, right? Where we're integrating a lot more bioretention, a separated bike lane, um, pedestrian pathways across the bioretention. So a lot more intensive. And it just shows some extremes of what you can do on a very light touch versus <coughs> a more intensive uh, configuration for Great Streets. So I mentioned before, there's a lot of different configurations for different types of streets. So everything from a major arterial, this is a reverse crown street where we have our bioretention in the center and we have street trees on the side. Sidewalks can be made of uh, uh, pervious pavement. Um, and this comes from some resources that helped to develop a few years ago um, that provide some, some standard plans of uh, different types of green streets. And I'll, I'll provide that resource at the end here. It was developed as part of uh, a state water board grant for the California Stormwater Quality Association. We also have minor arterials, right? Um, so smaller uh, sized streets. Um, but similar type of configuration with a, a, a depressed median. And then residential collector streets, they get even smaller. And then the point that I'm really trying to make here is that there's lots of different configurations and they can really fit all different types of sizes of roads. This is an example of a local street. This is what I'm talking about, about a crown street. You kind of see the crowning in the middle here. The runoff goes to the sides, and then we can integrate bioretention in a variety of different configurations within the roadway right of way as bulb outs or outside of the roadway right of way, kind of in the, in, in the large sidewalk areas. Um, so lots of different options to be able to integrate into, into green streets. So now I'm just going to talk and just touch briefly on, and we've already talked a little bit about this, of, of what are some of the multiple benefits available to integrate into green streets. So I put at the top of the list because as again I come from more of a stormwater perspective improving our water resources and helping to meet uh, compliance with our MS4 permits. Water supply and I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in the integrated water field of trying to provide and you know water is at a, at a premium in Southern California. Green streets offer an opportunity to integrate stormwater capture and use, whether that be local for even irrigation of some of our landscape features on streets, or providing more of a long-term supply, taking, taking that runoff, diverting it to, to sanitary sewer after our storm events have passed, lots of opportunity to integrate that into streets, and with streets providing a, a significant volume of runoff um, from our overall developed areas, they provide an opportunity to enhance that water supply. We have talked a little bit today about traffic calming and what we're really trying to do with Green Streets is provide more of an integrated transportation and stormwater management together. Not thinking about those things as separate or as stormwater as an add-on, but really kind of forward thinking and trying to integrate those two things together. Green streets, uh, we already talked about the benefit of, of flood control um, and can assist with flood control management from more of a distributed perspective. Heat Island is also a, a significant event. You guys, <clears throat> those of you that live and grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, it gets hot here. I mean, it hasn't been hot recently, but it's going to get hot in the next month or so. And if we can provide an environment that helps to cool down those hot surfaces, that really makes a whole lot of sense. There's also the opportunity for recreation, education, and aesthetics. So having more walkable streets provides more opportunity for people to get out and exercise and enjoy where they live. Um, and there's opportunities to integrate education about what we're trying to do with Green Streets at various places within a Green Street and of course, in, in improving aesthetics. There's a lot of movement towards urban forestry and uh, habitat. There's, uh, there's a couple grants coming out through um, the US Forest Service to integrate um, uh, more urban forests in the urban environment. And green streets can actually play a big portion of that. And, and the grants that I'm talking about recognize that green infrastructure can play a significant role in creating those urban forests. So we can integrate trees as part of developing green streets um, and create some habitat as well to try to bring back some of our, 
our, our natural friends into our urban environments. Um, so I talked about water supply on one side, but groundwater recharge is also a significant element for long-term sustainability of our, our water resources. So distributed infiltration, depending upon where it is, um, but these streets can also be optimally placed to help recharge our aquifers uh, moving forward. So lots of benefits. I'm sure there's a whole bunch that I haven't covered here, but this gives you just a, 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 a smattering idea of the different multiple benefits that are associated with green streets. So I'm going to finish up with just talking about some resources. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I helped with a, a statewide grant to provide technical resources for LID and green infrastructure. As part of that, we developed some code updates and some guidance on green streets. So that's all free and available on the CASCA website. You just go to the resources page, California LID, LID code updates, and go to Green Streets. Lots of standard plans and information there. <coughs> Another project that I led uh, a couple years ago was the Southern California Stormwater Monitoring Coalition, um, uh, California LID Evaluation and Analysis Network. So what we did here is we evaluated the benefits of different types of LID systems. We updated the Southern California LID manual, and then we put together a, a manual on the construction, inspection, maintenance, and monitoring of LID, system, LID and green infrastructure systems. So if you're thinking about, okay, what does this mean if I start implementing all these systems, this will help you understand what, what the maintenance needs are, what, um, what goes into construction and inspection. There's training, free training available, and other uh, LID and green infrastructure information. And then, uh, some of you may be familiar with the, uh, the NGICP, or uh, National uh, Green Infrastructure Certification Program. This is a program essentially designed as a workforce development program to start getting more people familiar with um, construction and maintenance of, of these systems. So I serve as the uh, certification committee chair, and this is a great program to get more people involved with green infrastructure and, and help to start maintaining um, uh, and implementing these systems correctly with all the new type of green infrastructure that we're going to be implementing uh, in Southern California. And then finally, just a couple other kind of more um, national resources. This is the Urban Stormwater uh, Guide from the National Association of City Transportation Officials. So essentially put together by transportation engineers and understanding kind of how you manage stormwater in an urban environment. And then finally, uh, US EPA came out with in 2021 their Green Streets Handbook, really good resource to kind of understand different configurations and all the nuances associated with Green Streets. And with that, I can take any questions. We're going to do questions a little later. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next up, we have Renee Salas and David Diaz to talk about the South Del Monte Green Street. Um, and so I will turn it over to them. Um, I'm the city manager for South El Monte, and it's great to be back in Pomona. I used to work here in Pomona. It's glad to see some familiar faces here. I was the public works director here for a few years. Um, I, my background is in engineering, so I'm really familiar with a lot of these components. And as a city manager for South El Monte, we're definitely integrating a lot of these ideas into our streets. I started there as a public works director, and one of the projects that came out of a lot of studying and planning and hindsight and forward thinking was the Merced Avenue Greenway project. So it's, it's, it's taken us a long time to get to this point, and I'll explain it as I go along. And David will also chime in towards the end. Uh, but it, it's well worth it. It's well worth it at the end, is, is my point. The, um, the initial phase, we have to go back to 2010 for our city, where the leaders at that time presented the community with, what do you want to see? What kind of improvements do you want to see in our streets in the city? We're only 2.5 square miles. Small city, 20,000 residents typically used to just doing the regular types of 
street reconstruction, the regular types of landscaping. So what do you want to see? So this was a plan that was done back in 2010, revitalization plan for the Santa Anita Tyler corridor. But what came out of that was a lot more. Next slide. So for this project here, one of the ideas that came out was, let's focus on Merced. Merced is a neighborhood street south of Rush, which is about one mile, and the north of Rush is another, in, it's warehouse industrial. So it's a different type of um, resident, different type of community for, for this uh, location. But as you recall, the Santa Anita corridor and Tyler corridor that mentioned earlier in the other slide, that's also part of another project that we have funding for. So we have a lot of our major streets in town are in different phases of Green Street development. This one is very, very close to starting, which I'm really excited about. So these are kind of the partners that were joined into doing the project from the beginning. Um, we have Council for Watershed Health, and Jason is here, and he's such a great guy and got everything going for us. Great partnership. Active SGV, of course, David. We couldn't live without David in our city. Climate Resolve, another great partner, getting the word out and working with active SGVs to get the community input. Next slide. So funding, there's a lot of funding out there, but it takes time and it takes patience and it takes time and it takes patience. Um, as I said, I, I started in 2017 working as a public works director and that's when I got involved with the project, working with uh, Council for Watershed Health and working with the design team, working with the outreach team. But there are funding out there, so it's not just one source, it's multiple sources of funding. So um, I was gonna mention all the funding, because <laughs> you sent me an email last night. So there's one source is uh, um, state conservation, CNRA, that was $3 million. And then we got another one from the State Water Board for $2.5 million. And then another one for Regional Measure W monies after the watershed, that was another $3 million. And then smaller pockets of funding that are out there for a total of about $10 million for one mile of street. And the reason why it's costing so much, we, we realize and want to include all these uh, stormwater capturing devices. So along this route, there are large tanks in the ground for stormwater capturing and infiltration into the groundwater basin. So that's one of the items that uh, draws, draws up the cost. So here's South El Monte. And you can see here the green is our, uh, give me, the green and purple that you see is our bike master plan that we're working on. We've already done uh, Durfee here as a, a bike master plan and we put uh, bike lanes in there. Some are protected, some are not. Merced is right here and you can see this is the first phase which we're working on that I mentioned south of Rush which is all pretty much residential and then north of Rush is uh, warehouse manufacturing. So different, different um, things that those two elements focus on. Residents want to see trees, residents want to have parking, warehouses want to have room for their big rigs, so different concerns. So this is what the street looks like now. Here's the residential side, here's the industrial side. And they will see a road diet. Because right now you can see there's two travel lanes, north and south, parking on either side. So we'll show you what that's going to look like. Next slide. More existing conditions, uh, missing sidewalks. Um, believe me, they look a lot better now, but they still need improvement. Um, so there's a lot of issues that we have to face. Of course, you know, that's not ADA compliant there, so there's a lot of issues that we have to address with this design. And, and this is what the, the watershed looks like. 
where we have uh, along Merced, everything's flowing to, we have the Whittier Narrows Park in this area, which is actually connecting to the San Gabriel Valley Basin and the Rio Hondo Basin. So this is what we're working with as far as the, the water flow in our city. So, and this is the community design selections that, and this, is, this was a, a lot of effort from activist GV and climate resolve going door to door, and I participated in going door to door, trying to convince the residents that this is a benefit, this will improve the aesthetics of the area, a lot of benefits with bike riding. Um, so even getting the council on board is really important. And they were very great at participating in all our outreach events, all our uh, on-site uh, picnics that we had and outreaches that we had to generate a lot of movement and concerns that residents may have had. And all in all, it came together, and these were the design options that they liked the best. So you can see here, one thing that residents want are, is turn radius to going to their houses on either side. So we put the left-hand turn in the middle there. But also, it's a, it's a road dike because it's only going to be one lane of traffic either way. So that, that's a big change for residents. Residents want a lot of accessibility, but this is a neighborhood area. Um, they do have concerns about large trucks going down. They're not supposed to, so there's gonna be a lot of signage involved where there's other truck routes available. They don't really need to go down here to get to the freeway, which is the 60 freeway. So that's gonna be a learning issue with um, the north part of Merced. And then didn't we have here um, on the north part, again, it was two, as you saw in the picture. Now it's just one either way, but we kept the turning lane for uh, the big rigs as well. Next slide. So this is some of the items that you see as far as components that we put for landscaping, stormwater capturing issues, and that you saw on the previous slides or the pre previous presentation. And this is like a conceptual drawing of what the big uh, tank will look like underground to filter, filter the storm water that's collected. And these will be placed strategically along the route of Merced on the south part and the north part. Next slide. And that's it for me. I'll give it over to David. Thank you, Renee. You see Mike. Yeah, I just, uh, maybe I'll just use my indoor, outdoor voice. It's kind of loud here. I will second that. Kaz is a great guy. This is actually his presentation. He's letting us use it here to share it with you all. So take, take, stand up, Kaz. Stand up. Everybody, went, that's Kaz right there. Casanova. That's also a rock star. Sasquatch. Check it out. Available on iTunes. Um, so my name is David Diaz. I'm the executive director of Active San Gabriel Valley. We're an environmental justice and public health nonprofit headquartered in the city of El Monte. And so we have great affinity for the San Gabriel Valley in, in tackling the climate crisis. Over the last dozen years, we've worked on a dozen or more master planning processes, including bike master plans, active transportation plans, to really bridge the connectivity gap that exists currently in the San Gabriel Valley for people that are trying to use other modes that don't rely on a car. And so we started off as a simple Facebook page uh, from a group of concerned residents in the San Gabriel Valley with the lack of opportunities for people walking, biking, and using public transit. And now we're one of the largest or the largest environmental justice and public health nonprofit in the San Gabriel Valley with primarily uh, local hires. So like folks from the San Gabriel Valley. So that's like a really unique thing. A lot of us uh, are really just concerned residents at the end of the day. I'm actually, a so I was a South Amani resident for about 30 years. Um, now I live in El Monte, so really far away from South Almani. Uh, I'm right on the border. Um, and so for us, we have a great affinity. I started out as a volunteer, and now here I am as the executive director of this organization. So um, really, we continue to see ourselves this way and operate this way as an organization, um, working with residents and community stakeholders to be able to develop multiple benefit projects to meet the multiple needs of our communities. And so this graph here that Kaz, again, has put together for us, um, illustrates this commitment to wanting to get the community and stakeholders involved at the initiation process for any project, right? These are 
big problems that we're facing and they require co-developing solutions with community. And so one of the other roles that I also uh, serve is on the Measure W Scoring Committee, also on the Measure W Upper San Gabriel River Watershed Area Steering Committee. Everyone say that with me. The Upper San Gabriel, no, I'm just kidding, don't say that. The WASC, right, for all those folks that love acronyms. Um, and so one of the things that's a challenge is really getting community members involved early in the process. I'm of the believing that if you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, or tens of millions of dollars of the public's money, you should include the public. <laughs> Controversy. Wow, people are upset about that. And so for us, it's an it's a iterative process that really needs to lead to meaningful community engagement so that you can get community-driven projects and community-driven design. Renee's kind of outlined how, how expensive the project is, and that's a direct result of like the meaningful community engagement that we did because one of the components that's really unique about this project is that we actually have the bike, the bike path the same level as the sidewalk. So it's the same grade. So it'll be more like a multi-use path. And it's a direct comment from residents. People already ride their bikes on the sidewalk because they feel unsafe riding their bikes in the street. What if we put the bikeway on the sidewalk and allow them to do that? Great. Great feedback. Let's try to include that in the design, right? So community member input and feedback and design were directly included as part of this project. And really, like for us, you know, again, you know, jobs training, health. Um, South del Monte has uh, one of the highest childhood and adult obesity rates in the county. We have some of the lowest park access in the county. I think our, our latest number is a little bit above half an acre per 1,000 residents. It's 0.71 per 1,000 residents in park space in the city. You know, the national average is six, the other averages are three acres. We have 0 0.71, 0 0.71. And so public safety, active transit in 2012 through 2014, Merced again became a priority for the community through the bike master plan process. That's another initiative that we worked on with the city of South Del Monte to identify you know, where people were biking, what programs, initiatives, policies, infrastructure they wanted to see throughout the community with the classifications of bikeways one, two, three, and four, uh, what destinations they wanted to go to, what were other concerns. And so in 2014, the city of South Del Monte also adopted um, their bike master plan. And then of course, some of the conservation and local flood issues that they were concerned about um, are all things that we take into consideration when approaching the community, talking to folks about why this project exists or why they, potential solutions that they may want to see in their community. Um, and so, you know, to that, we, we did pretty extensive outreach for this phase of it. So I want to say that this is just for that phase, this work is for that phase. There's going to be continuing and ongoing work that's going to happen as part of the future phases, which are kind of considered within the, all the funding <laughs> allocations that they mentioned here, because we really, again, think that you should involve the public in public works. Yeah? All right. So we did a lot of tabling events. Um, one of the things we also did uh, was we coordinated with the city um, and the elected officials and planning commissioners and even concerned residents or folks that weren't necessarily on board with the project to join us for a bike tour. So we took folks from the city of South Del Monte on a van, on a 15-passenger van, and we took them to the city of Santa Ana where they were able to see some of these Green Street elements, similar to how you are going to get on bikes or maybe in a van or in a car and see Green Street elements here in Claremont. Um, but we took folks to the city of Santa Ana and we actually rode our bikes around the city of Santa Ana, seeing all this Green Street infrastructure that was connected. Because one of the things that, you know, folks always get, or a comment that we always get, nobody rides bikes, no one's using the bike lane. Yeah, the half a mile class two that you stripe that goes to nowhere, like you wouldn't use a road that <laughs> takes you nowhere too, right? And so we wanted to show them this vision and be able to experience what it felt to have a connected network of traffic calming, green street infrastructure that allowed you to get to the places that you actually wanted to go safely. And so we took city council, city management at the time, uh, residents, planning commissioners on a bike tour of the city of Santa Ana. And that's like one of the things that like yielded like council support to get on board with kind of the vision of what it was, uh, community canvassing. Um, this is one of the things that Renee is always going to be like, way up here for me. He's the only city manager to date that has ever joined us to canvas, to go door to door, to talk to residents. And when I say canvas, I'm talking about like multifamily home canvassing. There's a big mobile home community. 
that's included in this area. There's some single families, some apartments. Renee willingly would join us. When are you going canvassing? Please include me. I'll see you out there. I'm going like, on Monday. It's going on Monday, you know? So, give, yeah, round of applause for Renee, you know? So, and, and I think, you know, that's like the, the type of work that we've done and the city has done to make sure that residents' input is being heard and then reflected in the design process. And so um, also the things that we did, you know, we did, um, we actually did uh, pedestrian and bike counts, you know, to select times to show people like, yes, people are actually biking. We took photos of folks biking up and down the street. Most of the folks that are biking are getting there, you know, they're not middle-aged men in Lycra, right? It's not, the, it's not those folks. It's actually like folks that are commuting, trying to get to and from work or school or get their child to and from school, the community center or some other place, right? And so five minutes, gotcha. And um, another thing that we did is uh, we included the youth. So at South Amani High School, we did focus groups with the youth because, you know, as, as you all are seeing and hearing today, these projects take a long time to get built. 2010, we're in 2023. By the time we break ground, it's gonna be 24, maybe? 23 this year? All right, five years from now, we're gonna 28, so about 18 years. <laughs> One mile, right? And so we need to make sure we include the youth so that they're engaged in this process, so that they know the public, the multiple benefits that are being considered. Um, again, door-to-door -door surveys. And when I say door-to-door -door surveys, it wasn't just like, hey, there's this project that's happening. It was actually like, here's this project, here are the considerations, here's the design, select your preferred design, do you have comments or concerns about the design? So we took like qualitative and quantitative data back from the residents. We had them like actually sign and like put their contact information, you know, for more information later to keep them updated and engaged with the project. So, you know, we really, uh, we sent out community mailers in multiple languages. We do everything in four languages at Active SGV, so English, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese to make sure that the communities that um, speak those languages are being included. Um, and so we also did multiple community workshops and then we really did, with my reigning time, I'll talk about like one of the cooler uh, things that we did for the community engagement. And so again, like we like providing the experience as the engagement and so we actually had a, a demonstration of what it would feel like to ride Merced, ride, ride a bike on Merced with the protected bikeway with live traffic. And so the team, you know, Alta Planning, Tetra Tech, Council, um, the city of South Almani at Active SGV, we coordinated this event where, you know, we invited folks to come out and we had, you know, kids, I mean, this girl is probably like six or seven years old, riding her bike safely and freely on Merced for the first time, you know. I have to add something. Yeah. Those plants that you see, this, the city doesn't own plants that they can put anywhere. Uh, they were donated for just purpose from a local nursery that we found and we actually went to go get them just for this event. Big team effort. It was a big team effort to get this done. But I, but I think, you know, like her smile and like the people in the back too, like that's, that's kind of what it was. And so after they got to ride the actual or experience the demonstration, there was an experience survey that, the thing, that they then took to provide further feedback and comments on what this would mean if it was actually implemented in the long term. So that was a really beautiful event. This is the door-to-door -door surveys. And then this is uh, one of my favorite concept renderings here. So like if you remember like from the existing conditions that we saw earlier, right, in terms of what Merced looks like now, right, that would be the residential corridor, the picture on the, on the right there to this. Isn't that amazing, right? And so, you know, we're, we're super thrilled about the design and the process and for construction to start and for shovels to be in the ground um, and for this street to be a real green street in the city of South Almani that's gonna connect people to places that they wanna to go to safely um, with, within the city of South Almani and beyond. So that's my time and thank you. So, next up, we have Chris Beers, who's a principal planner at the city of Claremont. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I should start by introducing, we do have one council person from the city of Claremont with us today, Jennifer Stark. Who's it? And Pomona. Pomona. Is. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and Jennifer has taken to riding her electric bike around town, so uh, pedal assist, and I applaud her for that. I, I do have this feeling that uh, electric bikes are going to significantly impact the way we get around our, our local 
um, trips in, in the future. So uh, you've got my presentation, or, sorry. <laughs> I thought that's what you were doing. <laughs> We did a lot of the public outreach and, and long-term um, planning, working with the community in order to create a, a green street that was completed in 2020, and um, uh, we, we regard as a big success. So with that said, it's the stretch of Foothill Boulevard through the entirety of Claremont, which is roughly 2.2 miles, uh, runs the entire length of the city from uh, east to west. It's our major thoroughfare, um, originally constructed in 1931, and is part of what became Route 66. Um, and in 2006, as part of our update to the city's general plan, we did hold a um, design charrette. We brought in a national firm to talk to our community about what they'd like to see on this street. Um, and at that time, Green Streets wasn't really a big thing, but the focus there was to um, try to take it from what feels like a state highway and instead move towards a um, more of a local street. So more pedestrian friendly, moving buildings closer to the street, introducing a mix of uses and um, uh, a lot of landscaping, more trees and things like that. So in terms of the, the more recent history, uh, this was a state highway and Caltrans owned and managed the street. Our residents had a lot of complaints about the, the sort of neglect that was given and the street just didn't feel like a Claremont street. So um, we entered into talks with Caltrans and were able to have Caltrans relinquish the road to the city so that the city could then take the roadway and make it um, realize the, the vision that we developed under the general plan. Along with the relinquishment came um, 5.7 million from Caltrans for, for refurbishments to bring it up to um, current standards. However, before we went and spent that money, the city chose to prepare a master plan that included extensive public outreach. We wanted to take our time, not just go spend that money right away and instead be very thoughtful about how, how we went and spent the money. The resulting master plan added features that, of course, far exceeded that funding, and uh, that was a matter of trying to figure out how to fund what we really wanted to do with this street. Oops, sorry. So I will introduce the project team. There was a lot of involvement from um, City of Claremont staff. So this was from the city manager level. Um, through the entirety of our community development department and community services department that does the maintenance. So I was the project lead in terms of developing a master plan. We had our engineering division involved and uh, we did have our city manager going out and meeting with residents who were not happy with some of the things that we were proposing. In addition to the city staff we had uh, for de developing a master plan document, we used RRM Design Group, who acted as the lead in the landscape architect, DKS Engineering, um, and Carl Bergen Associates, who's an arborist. A big part of our looking at the street had to do with um, trying to figure out what to do with some aging eucalyptus trees and to try to, again, develop a more sustainable um, treescape along the street. We later hired the uh, street engineering design team that included KOA, uh, a landscape architect from Gruen and Associates, and our eventual contractor on constructing the project was Gentry Brothers. So I'll go just very quickly. Um, these are some of the previous conditions that we were trying to address. A lot of pavement on the left, and we had thatchy, unkept um, landscapes that had been the responsibility of Caltrans maintenance, but they really weren't doing anything. So what we ended up with was a very thick thatch of volunteer trees and overgrown shrubs that uh, were destroying rear walls and creating all sorts of issues. But the people that lived behind them loved it. <laughs> so that was a bit of a problem for us that took a lot of time. 
we also had basically the, the landscaping was unsustainable and when I say that there was turf and I think we've all learned since we started this project that turf is not really a sustainable way um, to landscape large streets you have someone out there mowing in the middle of a median you have these sprinkler heads that are inevitably shooting water out into travel lanes so we've we've moved to a much more sustainable type of landscaping just to point out our uh, in general the crossings were not up to code from an ada perspective as well as just safe um, we, we've moved to much more visible um, striping uh, programs okay so um, other deficiencies, things that we were trying to address, non-compliance with stormwater catchment rules. Those have, since we started this project, gotten much more strict. And so we've, we've actually, we're, we're really happy that we had to jump on this and we were able to integrate, um, sort of move mid-project towards more, more stormwater catchment. Again, I mentioned the aging and sparse trees. We, we had a line of eucalyptus on the median and on both sides of the street that were really each reaching the, um, the end of their lives and starting to um, lose large branches and blow over whenever we had a, even a moderate wind event. There was lots of missing and sparse landscaping. Um, we had no bike lanes at all on the street and overall it just lacked a sense of uh, entry into the city or it didn't feel like uh, Claremont Street, which is a, reg a very common concern. Just some elements of the project design. Uh, so we were calling for narrowing lane widths to reduce vehicle speeds and accommodate bicycle lanes and sustainable landscaping. What we had in some sections of the street were 20 foot wide travel lanes. Um, those were ridiculously wide and it definitely contributed to speeding on the street. So uh, uh, narrowing it was going to have a positive impact, plus we were able to capture back all that space and utilize it for stormwater catchment, pedestrian and bicycle facilities as well. Um, we were intending again to, to add bulb outs, shorten um, crossing widths, uh, create improvements for um, bus stops as well, just try to make the pedestrian experience along the street better. Again, the, the bioswales, adding those and um, greatly augment the existing trees with variety of trees that would provide color throughout the year, um, a variety in canopies and avoid the, the um, brittle types of trees like eucalyptus. And of course the drought tolerant landscaping. So I was just saying to Jennifer that um, seeing South El Monte's timeline. I, I didn't feel so bad about showing this. It was a long process. It took essentially eight years from the time we got the money from Caltrans before we completed our construction. And frankly, we're still working. We, we uh, midway through the construction of the project, we, we decided to switch the um, bus stops that we were gonna install. And I'll show you a photo in a minute of what those are from what was originally designed to what we're doing as a citywide program. So um, some of the bus stops aren't even in yet and we hope to do that over the next couple of months. So again, you can see in 2012, Caltrans gave the street to the city. We went off and worked on a master plan. Then we um, hired, through a bid process, hired a design contractor um, who designed the project, moved to construction in May of 2018 and finished in October, um, I'm sorry, July of 2020, so just during COVID. I won't go over the details, but if uh, you wanted to ask, it's basically 2.2 miles, and um, these are some of the quantities that went into the job, which now feeds into this, the bottom line, what did it cost? So if you remember, we, we received 5.7 million, and we ended up spending 13.8. Um, but we got a lot of value out of that. This public process, we, we were able to deliver what the community wanted, and we were actually able to take that 5.7 million and some other local roadway funding sources and also bring in some very large grants that paid for roughly half of the project. So 
what what you heard earlier about the grants um, is a real thing. The money is out there if you have a good project to bring forward. This is what it looks like during a heavy rain event. So this is right after the job was complete. Um, landscaping's filled in quite a bit since then, and you can see what's happening is on the left, water's entering. It's flowing slightly downhill and fills up all this engineered bioswale. This was a heavy rain event, so you can see when it can't accept any more water, it just flows back out and goes into the regular storm system. I'll talk a little bit about the art side, just because I think it's, it's useful. It, it's part of what makes this project successful. We, we design these seating nodes in areas with a mix of DG colored concrete and these benches. We had this vision of trying to take the art of Miller sheets. So th these are actual mosaics from one of Claremont's most prominent artists. He's known for doing all the home savings buildings around the country with all their beautiful glass mosaics. So the office that built most of those mosaics is actually on Foothill right next to um, one of our stops today. And what we tried to do is take some images of those and work them into the, um, into the project design. So here's some of those benches once they're finished. They've just taken um, individual, the, in this case, they've taken the trees out of some of those sort of geometric trees that Miller Sheets was known for and, and put them on the benches. And then we use the mosaic concept and the entry signs. So this is an actual finished entry monument sign. This is the new bus shelter that we're working on and should be in place in the next couple of months. So just to summarize the, some of the policies that we implemented, we, we were trying to implement the city's general plan, that vision I described at the beginning of the speech, definitely focused on sustainability, MS4 percolating water into the ground, complete streets and green streets. So we tried to work everything into our project and we feel like we did and um, took a lot of heat as it was being constructed. But uh, because we went through such an extensive public input process, I won't, I won't belabor this, but we had the similar types of community engagement that they had in South El Money. Um, we'll, I'll say we also have the benefit of, of having some great groups, individuals, and organizations in town that, that spend a lot of their own personal time on the project. So Bob Perry, landscape architect, um, California Botanic Garden, who propagated plants for, for us to use. Um, the Bernard Biological Field Station, that's the, the um, college-run field that looks vacant, but they're actually doing scientific study in it. Adjacent to Foothill Boulevard, Claremont Senior Bicycle Group, Three Valleys Municipal Water District. They, that was actually a learning process that we came, we came in with a design that had um, dry wells that went quite deep, 50 feet into the ground, and we, in working with the local water district, had to um, shorten those. So we ended up, rather than the big chambers underground, we have a series of shorter dry wells that one fills and then fills, fills the next couple up. I can show you that as well on the tour. Um, we also have Sustainable Claremont, who's here today, and a, another local um, sustainable design advocate, uh, Mark Von Watke, who was really working <clears throat> very hard to get the community to understand what an opportunity <clears throat> that um, this was for us to capture um, stormwater and put it in the ground in an, in an otherwise fairly built out city. So just in terms of conclusions, the citizen support and participation in the process led to a vastly improved design that was uh, far um, larger in scope than what we might have done if we hadn't gone through and involved the public. Um, it did result in this more innovative, creative bioswale design that staff believes could serve as a model in surrounding cities. We also feel like the water that's going into the ground during the, the the rainy day, the rainy months is absolutely helping the um, performance of the landscape that we put in. Um, landscape, 
again, we feel it's, uh, there's a lot of details that I'm happy to answer about, but w we felt that we did a, a great job working with our staff, our designers, and um, Bob Perry to, to pick the right plants, and that they're, they're, so far they're doing well for us. We did, um, as a, and some of the, I, I don't want to paint too positive a picture. There was a, <clears throat> a lot of work in working with the um, citizens in town, and, and we did have a couple of losses. Really, the main one was that there was some infill sidewalk that we intended to put in, fought hard to try to put in, but just weren't able to put in because we had neighbors who did not want a sidewalk behind their house. Um, so you will see that there's a couple of um, spots where we're missing sidewalks where... Uh, we we fought the good fight, but we didn't didn't win that one. And uh, we have more landscaping. <laughs> we do have more landscaping and water percolation there, but it sure would be nice to have a sidewalk as well. What is the coolest feature that you've seen out there? And what I mean, clearly, this is a movement that's building, and I think you've sort of seen that over time. Can you talk about that and your passion that keeps you going around this work and what you see out there? Sure. So I think thinking about the coolest Green Street feature or Green Street that I've seen, I was in China and China has a big initiative called the Sponge City Initiative and they're spending trillions of dollars on this type of infrastructure around China. So the cool feature that I saw, uh, it was a, a Green Street dedicated kind of, they, they bike a lot in China, so dedicated bike path. Um, you know, they had pervious pavement sidewalks. But the coolest feature was that they integrated tanks underneath their bioretention systems. And then they used the water in the tanks to irrigate some of the bioretention systems. So I thought that was a really cool way of like, okay, yeah, we, we like to infiltrate water into the ground, and especially in Southern California where water is at a premium. Um, so I've started some designs similar to that, and um, I think it's a really cool way to think about not just capturing the water, but, but using it. And then I think some of the things that really keep me motivated um, in designing these systems is I love to go out and see what the possibilities are. Like going out to any different type of street and you know, taking into, into account all the different physical constraints, utilities, um, and then the community input too on like what they want to see, and then designing a system that meets all those needs. It's really, it's challenging, but it, it's a lot of fun. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, next up, Renee. Uh, so, you went out and you canvassed. <laughs> you were out there in the streets, and I think this partnership with all the partners that you mentioned, um, is really inspiring to see. Can you talk more about um, your relationship with community groups and community members, and how, how, what advice you can give to other city um, folks to, to say, how do we let this process in? How do we make this collaborative? Um, and what, I mean, you kind of shared the benefits of that, but sort of all the, a little bit more about the ins and outs of that relationship. Sure, I think that's important when you have initiatives, you need to get the partners in the community involved. Um, not just for Green Street projects, but for wellness projects, community activities, uh, recreation activities, even for equipment replacement that you have at your parks. It's important to get, even your water company, the water company in your area is important to get them involved. We actually have, we're probably one of a few cities where we have recycled water that is uh, feeding all our landscaped areas, all our parks, all our medians. And it's a partnership with uh, the people involved that, and, and we had a planning commissioner that uh, works for the water company. So looking at those key stakeholders to try to find ways to improve your community. We also, another example is our small pocket park is one of a few parks that is um, maintained by EV equipment. So our, our lawnmowers EV, our uh, hedgers, our blowers are all EV. And we got a grant from AQMD for that. So looking at those opportunities, working with community members, your churches, um, even special events. We have about 35 special events every year. Uh, we have concerts in the park starting tonight. 
We use those um, activities to get input from the community. We're doing a wellness program with the school district where we're, we're going to pass out surveys to see what they would like to see in their communities. Do you want smoke-free areas? Do you want um, to get well or healthy eating establishments? So it's, it's all-encompassing and not just streets. Streets are important as well, but there's other health issues that um, I think uh, you touched on because we're such a, a we're in an area where it's um, a restaurant, you, you don't have a lot of choices, you don't have a lot of, we only have one grocery store that's feeding our community right now. So I think it's important to just have those connections. And just a follow up, um, I've heard before fears of what happens when you kind of let community in and what would you say to that? And, and how, do you, how do you think about that in terms of you know, is community going to understand? I've heard that as well. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, it's, and, and that goes with going out, going out and explaining the program or the project. Uh, having those moments with them on a one-on-one -on -one is really important to gather that input. You're going to find people, the naysayers, that don't want, you know, this in my backyard. I don't want people getting that close to my property. But you have to look at the long-term benefit. What's it going to look like 10 years from now? What's it going to look like 20 years from now? So those are important conversations to have with all the community. And we're so fortunate that we have those connections where we've gotten grants for all our other streets, planning grants, conceptual idea grants. One is for Rosemead, which was with Caltrans. Another one was with CARB, Cal Air Resources Board, for Rush. Similar types of first step grants to get input from the community and the businesses. Businesses are important too. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to David. Um, on the flip side, I think it's an incredible relationship that you have. Um, can you give some advice to uh, nonprofits, community members that are trying to build these relationships and get kind of on the inside and a part of these processes for the planning? Hmm. <laughs> Um, I would say it's like anything else, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're in things with sincerity, authenticity, with the right intentions, and then just continue to build from there. I think, you know, again, we're, we're a place-based organization, and so our geographic bounds are the San Gabriel Valley, like you're not going to see us in the San Fernando Valley um, doing any, any, any work there. And so we, we've taken the time to really get to know city staff, to get to know the stakeholders, Again, we have an intentionality around local hire. So like when you actually hire people from the community, that dynamic changes a lot. Um, especially, you know, there's this uh, sometimes consultant itself comes loaded. Like I'm a consultant with X firm and people will label you. And I think that that resonates differently from like, hey, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your neighbor. I live here. I've, I've been here. My kids go to school here just like your kids. You know, that, that hits a little bit different. And so I think for community-based organizations, um, particularly like local hire is a thing that I would, that would uplift a lot um, as, you know, those are the folks that are going to know the community the best and be able to work with others um, and have a similar lived experience. Because at the end of the day, it's like anyone can come with any amount of technical expertise, but does that supersede like someone's lived experience? I don't believe so, right? So, um, when it comes to certain issues. So I think that's really important. And then for community stakeholders, I think, you know, when you have cities like the city of South Almonte that are on an ongoing basis, like allowing for opportunities for engagement, it makes it like pretty easy to provide feedback and input. Again, the city of South Almonte is 2.5 square miles. And, you know, so it's like, it has a small town feel. So everybody knows everybody. The city council is pretty involved there. So um, I think that changes from community to community. Obviously, as it, get lar it gets larger, it gets, becomes a little bit difficult. But... Um, I would say the, the easiest avenues for people to connect are obviously knowing what's going on in the community, city council agendas, if you want to get even further invested, become a planning or uh, parks and rec commissioner and sure. look at different committees that they offer um, to get involved. So now we have a women's commission. Now they have a women's commission. And so, you know, there are definitely for like uh, individual community members, like ways to get involved with your local city government. Great, thank you, David. Um, and lastly, Chris, um, so it's really, it, I think it's exciting to see the, a finished street with your pictures. Can you talk about what it's been like, you know, construction ended, 
And what a time, I mean, for construction to coincide with the horrible pandemic and um, more people going outside, right? Wanting to walk, wanting to be in nature. Can you talk about what it's been like since construction, sharing the model, um, and, and what you've noticed in seeing community interact with those new futures that you have? Well, I'll just start personally and say that um, I, was, I was telling somebody in the back that as we were constructing it, there were lots of naysayers. They, they were spreading rumors like we were switching from a four-lane street to a two-lane street. And rather than calling the city and asking, they were blasting it out on social media and all sorts of just negativity was coming out. Um, that has completely subsided since the project ended. And what I get, and I and just fairly recently, because it's spring and everything looks really amazing, right? Um, I had one of the most sort of toxic personalities that had given me a lot of hard time call and grudgingly say, you know, Foothill looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I guess all I can say is that it, um, it's, it's, it's tough. It really is. It's hard to bring people along. A lot of people come in with their own conceptions. We knew all along that if we took out that thatch of shamel ash trees that was going to destroy their sewer line and their back property walls that um, in relatively short order they'd be happy. But there would be some pain. They would go without that green screen that they had between them and Foothill Boulevard for a while. And we feel like we... we spent a lot of time and energy trying to make sure that that, that period was as short as possible. And um, we, we ended up leaving some trees that normally we might not have, but we're going to let the, the new trees fill in and then we can take out the, the topped eucalyptus and other really bad species out in, over time. And that was something, a deal we kind of had to promise. Great, thank you. I think there is a big lesson on the time that it takes um, the money, but our communities deserve it, right? And we were talking about all the benefits that you can't just look at the money, right? It's all the benefits that come with them. All right, audience, do you have questions for our panel? Okay, let's start there. Um, so I think it's incredibly great that you guys were able to involve the community. Um, I find it really difficult. I live in an HOA, and um, even getting, you know, 243 owners to participate in anything is extremely difficult. So kudos to you guys for, for doing that. Um, I want to know what advice you have to be able to get the community to participate. Uh, other than, I mean, canvassing, you know, all, all, the, all that has not worked for, for me, so. I'm, I'm going to pass the mic to the professional at that. I'm, I mean, <laughs> Claremont, it's a little easier than a lot of other places because we have a higher level of just public participation than a lot of communities, but it was it was hard. I mean, we kept hearing from people we'd not heard of when we were a year and a half into the process. So um, at any rate, let's let the professional tell you about it. Um, I would say like there are a lot of things trying to grab attention, right, in, in everyday life. And so uh, one of our purposes is to make sure that it's multifaceted. Um, and so if it's not canvassing, like for us, we also do phone banking. So we'll call you at your house. You don't pick up from us. We're going to send you a text message. If you didn't get my text, then I'm going to send you a mailer because that's the address that we have on record. We've also put like banners um, on places. We put sticker decals on your street with the QR code to learn more about the project. We put up the website. This thing is, there we go. Build a, build a project website. Um, we include it in the city newsletter. We're then also on the actual street where that improvement may happen. We'll organize special events such as walking, biking, or demonstration events. Um, and so really, I think it requires a multifaceted strategy to try and reach people multiple times. You know, And so that's kind of the intent with our outreach, in addition to the, the workshops. Like for the workshops, one of the, one of the things that we always want to include are incentives, food, child activities, simultaneous translation, and transportation assistance, right? To get people to and from meetings. If it's something more smaller, more intimate, stipends, like to pay people for their time, um, whenever that's, that's an eligible cost. 
And so, again, it's like we're competing with people's time and attention with several other things. Well, like I've sent three or four mailers to someone's house, and they'll be like, I never heard of the project at all, you know? There's like a banner across the street from their house about the project, you know? So there's always going to be folks that say, I've never heard of it. Um, but really, it's about building a multifaceted outreach and engagement strategy to make sure that you're meeting people where they are, where they visit, and the language that they're most comfortable in, and the place that they live through a method that's most convenient or preferred for them. So I would say just you know, try multiple strategies to get to folks. The folks are going to give you different responses and levels of engagement, and that's OK. You know, um, most of the folks that like, are supportive of a project are like, why not? Like, this makes too much sense. Like, why are you even asking me about this, right? But then you have folks on the other end that are like, why are you doing this project? And they're the ones that are going to hit up Renee, and they're the ones that are going to go to the city council meeting because they're so agitated or upset about the project. And so, of course, there's going to be different levels of uh, engagement across the spectrum. So, And if I may yeah. add, if you having different times to meet, I think it's important. People are busy during the week, do a weekend event, or do uh, an evening or, or morning event, scheduling different times when people are available. But also asking them, so what, what do you want to see? What is your alternative, I think, is important, too. And that. So one of, one of the first green streets I designed, I, I mentioned it up in uh, Palo Alto. And the uh, public works director had a great idea. This neighborhood was really tight knit. And they had a, an annual Memorial Day barbecue. And so we decided to do an event associated with that barbecue. Because we already knew people were going to be out and about. We did a, a, a chalking event and brought in plants that they could look at. And that was really successful because people, you know, show that we're committed to the project. We're doing it on our own time. It was on a holiday. Um, so I think trying to collaborate on different events, going to where people are already at is really helpful. And then involving them in the design process is really key. Having them select type of plants, configurations, so that they feel like, it's not just your project, it's their project. They feel ownership in the project. It's really critical. Yeah, and the last thing I'll add is put that line item in the budget. <laughs> community organizing, community outreach, there's so many budgets I see without that or like a tiny amount, you know? But it takes time. I mean, you saw the list of events. It takes time, it takes money, and, and hiring professionals that know how to do it I think is something that I see a lack of as well. Um, all right. Uh, oh no. Well, let's just keep going around. Yeah. Um, but go ahead and put your hand up. Did, did you want to go? Yeah, I was wondering uh, what sort of strategies or tools that exist for connecting regionally. So moving from one town into another town so there's connectivity. Uh, so that the street doesn't feel like like one city and then you go into another city so it feels like we're all neighbors and they all feel nice. Uh, that's a great question. So for us, for South Almonte, our, our neighbor to the north is Almonte. And we have a great relationship with the Public Works Department uh, to whenever they have a, because our borders are so weird. I don't know how they came up with this. You could be on one side of the street while your neighbor is in a different city or your sidewalk would be in, in El Monte, but you live in South El Monte. So whenever there's a border project, and we've done at least three with them since I've been here, where the majority of the project's in their city, but it encompasses some small areas of ours. So we have an agreement with them, a written agreement that we would pay for our share of the design and construction of the street improvement, sidewalk improvement, and it works well. It works really well. Uh, there's a, a lot of added steps there where there's an agreement in place where you both have to sign in. And it's, we love it. So w one of the things that I've been working on um, in South Orange County is more of a regional framework of how you don't just necessarily do things city by city, but you take a region and you come up with a, we're going to be developing a Green Streets master plan. Right? And so that way it's more integrated and, and cohesive of how everything fits together. That in combination with more regional type systems and getting water to, uh, to water districts. So it's, it's more of a comprehensive plan. That, that's probably the best way to ensure that you have this good transition between cities is, is more of a, a regional plan. Uh, let's give one more round of applause for all of our speakers and our panelists.
Thank you so much today.